what is the most valuable input we could contribute to the conversation knowing that, yeah, we're not gonna spin faster than robot dancer. You know. Well, I think there's, a, there's this interesting thing, right? Because of course there's a, there's, a, there's a movement in one direction, then there becomes an anti-movement, right? There's a response to that, a reaction to the other direction, which al almost um, then begins to set up, well, this is one thing and this is another thing, and depending on what side you're on, this is good, this is bad, or this is good, this is bad. And what I think where we were, we're wanting to move towards is some integration of that that, that, doesn't, that doesn't polemicize one as being bad and one as being good, but actually begins to I integrate somehow um, and, and sort of see where that leads us. That's what I'm kind of curious about. Because I, I think what's a lot of artists are using technology, right? But a lot of artists, as you said, there's this anti -ver I would hate to see us be like, oh, no, I'm not going to use technology because it sucks, you know? And I don't know, there's something more than that, yeah. I mean, we, we all live with technology, whether we, you know, we, we think we make it in our art or not, so it's changing our mind. Right. And regardless of whether we're drawing by hand or drawing by tablet, um, that's re it's still reflected in that, right. the experience that comes out in the work. And maybe it doesn't really ultimately have to do so much with the tool, unless you really are using some aspect of the tool that um, is really different than what you could do in any other way. And one of the ways I think it's most useful is in its ability to network you with other people using those tools. So, I, I mean, even I think right, 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 a lot right, right. of artists who don't do specific technologically work are probably working at social media a lot more than I am. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and that is expanding their universe and their consciousness. And in that way, they're completely embedded in technology. So, let's, and, and yeah, let's I just wanna, I just had this thought, I mean, it, there is systems out there that create art. There's computer systems out there that create art. And I don't want to belittle any artist. But it's not just what is created, but it's how it's received by the, the individual viewing it. So fine, there might be a, a piece of art that's created by a computer, but it's me that, that's receiving it and interpreting it and synthesizing it. That's right. an awful word, but it's, it seems appropriate. Um, and so that is, is a human endeavor as well. So it's not just the creation, but it's the interaction that's so important in art. Right. So we have about five minutes. Let's see if anybody in the audience has a question they wanted to ask. Here's one right here. Um, I guess it's just a quick comment, which like comes up a lot in this sort of conversation, and I think it's important to remember that there are these ethical questions that sort of, can, I think that the technology is making us continue ethical questions that were already there. And there's a lot of things about humans that actually aren't so great. You know, I mean, like, there's so many things, like the sort of example you gave about the child, like, this child that, like, could you make your child more smarter or not? But there's sort of all kinds of non-technological things that already do that socially. So I guess, like, the conversation always makes me think about that. Like, are we really that special in a way? Um, and then the other thing was that, I guess, like, I get sort of confused between the two conversations, which is, like, the robotic one and then the technology that's more sort of about um, interaction and communication, things like social media, and then what was starting to be talked about with nanotechnology, which I'm really curious about, um, and I would love to talk more about that today, like the stuff that becomes part of bodies or becomes part of genetics and how you go from something that has an on and off switch, because I think the obvious question about consciousness has to do with an on and off switch. Um, but so when you go beyond the on and off switch and you have something that goes into the body, does that still have an on and off switch? And what happened, you know, and those, so those kinds of technologies that become sort of part of a network where you can't really distinguish seem really interesting and totally different than like a sort of object, like a robot that might sort of look kind of like a intelligent thing, sort of. It doesn't seem like it matters that much whether that's intelligent or not. Um, so yeah. yeah. You know, to your first point, I think it, I really, uh, that's a really interesting, like the idea that we actually prefer some sort of um, um, perceived blamelessness. It's not my fault that right. my child became this sort of, it just happened. That, that we're actually more comfortable with that, that given the choice to direct that, all right, are you going to make your choice to have your child be a, an ethical human being? You know, and then you suddenly have some greater degree of responsibility for what decisions that child is making, where before you're like, well, I don't know, genetics, my ancestors, how did it happen? It's not my fault, they are what they are, right? So I think that's a really, that's a really potent ethical question. Yeah, I mean, 
mean, there's a crazy debate going on right now. Apparently, they're trying to, somebody's put on the bill in San Francisco to outlaw circumcision, right. which right. I think is just a, cra it's like the craziest debate because it's all about this choice question again. Right. And like yeah. people wanting yeah. to give up, actually having to make a difficult, I mean, from my point of view, it seems people wanting to get up, give up what having to make what is, can be a difficult decision or something. Yeah, exactly. We had a question over here. Hello? Yeah. I'd like to paint a future of the Earth-sized intelligence. Um, but start by uh, thinking about uh, something when I was studying game theory 20 years ago. And we started with the very simple knowledge of like alpha, beta <laughs> pruning and things like that. It was clear to me after I had a game that easily beat me that um, the sum, the whole, was much greater than the sum of the parts. And having gotten the game to a certain point in which it beat me, it was not possible to slice it open and look at it at any particular point of time and see what it was, how it was connected so as to produce that particular behavior. So I'm thinking, then I connected, connecting it into evolution, um, that human brain is the result of a very, very long period of evolution, but it also is uh, subject to en any number of possible outcomes. We didn't have to come out the way we've come out. We could have come out not intelligent or completely different. So here we are now, I guess, approaching this singularity point Rather than looking at um, trying to create, the, the langu I heard the language of machine, machine, machine over and over again. Well, if we, what if we looked at what's going on now in terms of the way human beings are not just going to um, enhance themselves, but by the very connections that we keep enhancing between us through our technology and f Facebook and things like that, that the Earth itself, all human activity, there are connections and activity become a machine itself, a thinking machine that is a, a random and infinite combination of possible outcomes so that we do end up with a Earth-sized machine that still slicing it open cannot figure out why it is manifesting the intelligence that it is. And so I can imagine that being a very likely outcome in the short term, but analyzing that and seeing the patterns of intelligence would be very, very difficult. Has anyone considered that? I'm certain yes, but not me. I mean, I, I no, I mean, no, it, that's, it's a really big question. Yeah, but it's an indication of the kind of thinking that's going yeah, on. And yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of study yeah. going into this. And I, I would. Okay, we have time for one more, and then we're going to take a little break. So there are a couple of other films that have either just recently come out or are in the pipeline concerning the singularity idea, and I wonder if you'd be willing to comment on those and where this sits in yeah. relation to them. And the other part of the this question is... This is the is, film yeah. to see. No. <laughs> no, I'm totally joking. So yeah, there's, there's two other films right now that are feature length films, mine's a feature length film, it's 90 minutes, uh, that, are, that are about the singularity or about Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil, um, we saw him a couple of times, we didn't have a lower third saying this is him, it was earlier in the film, we, got it. we had his name and his, who he is, and, uh, so you, that was earlier in the film, didn't see it. Um, so he has his own film out, um, and it was uh, produced by a local filmmaker, Toshi Hu, Hu. Um, and this is very different from that film. That film's an advocacy film. I don't know if anyone in this room has seen that film. It's an advocacy film, uh, that film. Um, there's another film, and I don't know if it can be seen. It's showed at a couple of places it's around the country. It's on Netflix. Transcendent Man is and then, streamable on Netflix. Well, no, that, that, that was Ray's film, what I was talking about, a film called uh, The Singularity is Near the Movie, it's called. And then there's That's a the film. That's the Toshi Hu film. Right. And then there's a film out now called uh, Transcendent Man, which is a documentary about Ray. Um, and I know a couple of people in the audience have seen it. And that's out and about. It's, you can get it on Netflix. You can get it on uh, iTunes. Uh, it's in a couple of places. And that's, that's more of a documentary about Ray. And, and again, I would, I would, 
I want to kind of say it's a little bit of an advocacy film. Um, my film, I, I see it as very different because it raises a lot of questions that those films don't raise. This is a lot deeper rather than saying, ooh, the singularity is this technological, really cool thing with lots of eye candy. I try to stay away from that and instead make it really grounded in who we are as people rather than just, ooh, the technology and get blown away by that. Okay, so as always happens, we're at a point where um, you know the conversation is really rich, but we need to take a little break here for about 10 minutes. There's food and drink at the back if you want to get that. And come on back, and Jaron Lanier will be here. Doug, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Moving into part two. Um, we're very excited to have Jaron Lanier here um, this afternoon to carry on this conversation in uh, new and different directions. Jaron is a computer scientist, composer, visual artist, and author who writes on many topics. He's the author, most renowned author of You Are Not a Gadget, named one of the top 10 books of 2010. He's on uh, Time Magazine's list of uh, the 100 most influential people in the world. Um, he's well known for his work in virtuality, in virtual, sorry, virtual reality. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be a fascinating time with Jaron this afternoon. So, Jaron Lanier, welcome. Hey, thanks. Oh, so um, I, what I've been doing at talks is I've been starting with music because uh, uh, I find language to be one of these newfangled technologies that isn't quite fully working yet. It seems kind of buggy. So uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll, this, is, this is a cool instrument. It's called a can. It's from Laos. And I'll explain why I've been using it so much on the road in a second after I, I play on it. So um, this is from Laos, it's called a can. And one of the reasons I really like it is that I believe it's the first example of the invention of digital information in human affairs. So far as we know, it's older than the abacus. It's older than Sumerian markings. It's an example of a bunch of parallel objects that are either in an on or an off state. <laughs> it's prehistoric. Uh, it's influenced the West twice. In ancient times, these were traded on the Silk Route, and the Greeks knew about them. The ancient Romans, since they were Roman, decided they wanted to copy it and make a gigantic version, which was called the Hydralis, and was the supercomputer, I suppose, of the Roman Empire. It was too big to be operated by people, so it was operated by uh, slave boys um, pulling on giant planks, and that became the keyboard eventually that turned into pianos and organs. It was used to uh, accompany gore in the Colosseum. It was the entertainment 
while you watched animals and people go at each other. It evolved into the pipe organ and eventually the piano. But because it had started out so large in Rome and because it could only be played in a semi-automated fashion, from the very birth of the keyboard, there was this, always this idea that there'd be an automated version of the same thing. And so there were player pianos and player organs very, very early in the development of keyboard instruments. And in fact, there came to be an improvising player piano, which didn't always play things exactly the same way. And it was that device that inspired a fellow named Jacquard to make a programmable loom. And that, in turn, inspired a guy named Charles Babbage to make a programmable calculator. And here we are. So this is the first computer. And the funny thing about this one is that, um, as an expressive device, I find it vastly superior to anything digital I've ever worked with. And I've had the privilege of working with the very best digital stuff that there's been. So I, I think it's a matter of subjective judgment whether this has represented a path of progress or not. Because <laughs> I think this thing's pretty hot. Um, so. I, um, watching the film just now is funny for me because I know most of the people in it to some degree or, or other. A lot of the figures are in it are people I've known for a really long time. And I kind of know them well enough to not, I don't know how to put this exactly, I don't necessarily take everything at face value and fully seriously because part of it is a bit of an act. Like, um, Ray Kurzweil is a great guy, he's a buddy. We used to do joint talks because we could put on a better show that way. It's like more entertaining to have people disagreeing than to just have somebody advocating. And um, it, was, it was cool. And you know, does he really believe this stuff? Kind of yes and no. I mean, it's sort of like um, anytime you get to be a good enough showman, you start to believe your own line, right? You know, to some degree. There's always a little bit of ambiguity about it. So for me, um, this stuff maybe reads a little bit differently than it would to somebody who's exposed to this sort of material. And I'd like to try to give you a sense of how it reads to me for what it's worth. Um, the first thing to say is that um, the, uh, the pragmatic side of it, the question of what'll really matter, is usually put in a future tense. Uh, if machines get this way or that way, or techno medicine, or nanotechnology, or genetic engineering, or whatever it might be, if certain things progress in certain ways, what will that mean to humanity? What will happen here and there? What will we think about consciousness? But there's an immediate present tense pragmatic side to it, which I deal with all day long, which is uh, um, much more important, I think, because it's already with us and also easier to understand since it's not speculative. And yet there's, this, there's almost a conspiracy not to talk about it, which is are we designing present day machines from an imaginary machine centric perspective or from a human centric perspective? And that, that becomes the really important question. So uh, in order to try to give you a sense of what I mean by that, I, uh, uh, I should start off. So <laughs> this always becomes a little hard because I end up sort of disagreeing with and criticizing in public people who are actually buddies of mine. It's like everybody in this world is somebody I've kind of worked with somehow or something. So um, I, I'll start by biting the hand that feeds me as closely as possible so that it's nonpartisan. So since I'm doing my research these days in Microsoft's labs, I'll try to criticize Microsoft more than others. But the truth is, it goes around, believe me. Uh, so uh, you're using Microsoft Word, and there's this moment where it decides, oh, you want an outline, don't you? And then suddenly, like, there's this outline. And you say, no, I don't want an outline. Then you have to do all this work to avoid the outline. <laughs> and then um, you end up training yourself to avoid accidentally allowing it to think that you want an outline, right? Okay, now, the guy, the guy who got that auto outline thing in there is a cool guy, he's a friend, I see him all the time, I've known him for 30 years, he's the president of the Artificial Intelligence Association this year, and um, he's from Stanford uh, originally, and you know, if you talk to him or a whole bunch of researchers who work with him, they'll say, we do tests and in the, whatever, you might make fun of it, but in our test, it appears that the software is actually becoming predictive and is getting smart and knows when the people want an outline most of the time. So this is artificial intelligence making life better. 
Then there's some other people who, de who take tests and say, no, it's actually making it harder to use because you're only looking at the good cases. What about all the people who have to do the extra work to avoid it, mistakenly thinking they want an outline? <laughs> and the truth is, there's this, you can do all these objective tests, but ultimately the interpretation of the test is philosophical. And that's a very weird thing. You can equally convince yourself legitimately that um, the thing's becoming smarter and it's getting good at deciding when, oh, Lilith, are you gonna go? It's my daughter, she's, I think she's sick of hearing me blab and blab and blab all the time. <laughs> imagine if you had to hear this all day long, like at bedtime. <laughs> like, just think, just imagine how horrible that would be. Anyway, um, uh, so the problem becomes, you can, um, you can frame it and you can say, yeah, uh, this thing is predicting X time, X percentage of time that people want it, but you're not, you're not measuring how people change. I was really struck, one of the quotes in the film is, the brain is a fixed object that you can study, but of course it isn't. It's the ultimate non-fixed object. Uh, people change themselves, so if you change yourself to avoid it, thinking that you want an outline, has it gotten smarter or have you made yourself stupider to make it look smarter? And the interesting question there is that you, there's no objective test for that. We've left the world of engineering behind. We can no longer answer that <laughs> with a definitive engineering-minded test. It really becomes a philosophical question because either interpretation is valid. It's, so it's a very interesting moment there. And how do you decide which is the better interpretation? So my view is that um, a whole host of pragmatic arguments from Occam's razor style arguments about simplicity to uh, arguments that maintain your freedom of choice as an engineer so that you can still be active and you don't remove your abilities to act because of your philosophy. There are a whole bunch of arguments that can become a little tedious if you really want to follow them to their conclusions that lead me to feel that the pragmatic answer if we want software to get better is to not believe that it can get smart because we can never tell when in fact it's just us making, our, making ourselves stupid to make it look smart, okay? Um, it's not that we know for sure that we're making ourselves stupid, it's that we can't tell. And of course, then this becomes a very interesting twisted thing. Well, if you can't tell if you're making yourself stupid, are you not making yourself stupid? <laughs> is that not, you know, and, and th so this goes round and round and round. And the truth is there's no definite resolution. This is one of those cases where you have to Make a choice, a very interesting, a conscious choice. It's, you know, it's like one of these moments where you just have to decide, okay, I'm just gonna say there's something to this whole being human thing, I'm not sure what it is, but I'm just gonna decide to walk down that path instead of the other one. At present, uh, there's a kind of a divide in technical culture which path you walk down, with some people preferring to think of the software getting smarter and others thinking that that's an absurdity. And if you were gonna say, how's the horse race going? Which side is winning? It's kind of interesting. I mean, nobody really takes a poll. It'd be, I don't know if you could even. It'd be hard to articulate it well enough to get good data. Um, my impression is it's half and half. Um, I would, my impression is that a lot of the top engineers, when they're younger, especially at the start of their careers, go through an infatuation with machine-centric thinking. And then after a while, especially when they have their own kids, when they start to, basically get a bit of life experience, suddenly, you know, it starts to turn around and you start to see it shift. So it might be a youth old age thing, but I've also seen a lot of cases that go exactly in the opposite direction as people grow up. So it's not, that's not universal at all. Um, does it track gender? Does it track race? Anything like that? I have no idea. Not that I've noticed. I mean, I have noticed a phenomenon where a lot of times if you're gonna be female and you're gonna get in a hot computer science department to get there, you have to totally outgeek the geeks so that you're so Aspergery that you like totally blow away their Aspergeriness. <laughs> and so there, there are a lot of people that are kind of like that. That's like one phenomenon you see. Um, but once again, not universally. Um, the, uh, this idea that you can't tell if machines are getting smarter or if people are making themselves stupider to make the machines get smarter. Um, really becomes consequential when you deal with bigger situations than just like an outline and a word processor. Um, I think the uh, economic crisis, the mortgage crisis, is a great example of it, where uh, the problem, you know, in the past, um, there have been all kinds of confusions and collusions and corruption that created economic collapse uh, periodically. So there's part of the story that's old. What's different this time is people haven't done it with computers before. I mean, basically, uh, what happened in this case is we set up 
these algorithms that were supposed to be smart about who should get a loan, and um, the people who were selling the loans made that way, either deliberately made themselves quote unquote stupid in order to trust them or actually genuinely trusted them in a way it doesn't matter. So <coughs> they did the same thing that you do in order to use um, a, a word processor and not get caught in outlines all the time. They bent, they bent over backwards making themselves stupid in order to make the algorithms look smart. And of course, it doesn't work. You end up, <laughs> you en you end up with, with stupid loans. Um, I think another great example is No Child Left Behind, where we're doing the same thing with testing, where we use algorithms to tell us that, uh, you know, what's going on with kids. And even though, on some level, we've got to know we're making ourselves stupid to do this. I mean, I think everybody, you know, and this, this gets back to what I was talking about before, that there's a sort of a multiple personality effect that happens when you think about these issues, where sort of on lo one level, you're kind of, yeah, I believe in the singularity, and I believe that, but whatever, whatever the stuff is. But then on some other level, like, oh, come on. <laughs> you know, you kind of know. And so you kind of know, like, these tests with no child left behind, of course they're nonsense. You know, er like, even the people in the center, but like, on one level, during the day, they might say, oh, they're really great. But then they kind of know that there's, it's kind of ridiculous, too. And so it's, we kind of maintain these multiple contradictory interpretations of the world at once. Um, and uh, the... Um, there's a whole, there's a, a world of this that's happened with internet services lately where, um, and this gets into whole the politics of the internet, which I don't want to turn this into unless there's a profound interest in it in this audience, but there, um, a lot of what you see of the world is determined by algorithms where Netflix decides what movies you want to see and Amazon recommends books. And those are two fairly non-objectionable examples in a way because they're pretty honest with you and Amazon even goes to the trouble of trying to give you visibility into what happened. But then when you get into the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, or the Bings, I should, I should, I'll, I should criticize Bing, um, but at any rate, with, with these other services, what's happening is you start to get this world presented to you based on a model of you, and since that's your way of seeing the world, you can't help but gradually become a little bit more like this model. Um, uh, Ellie Pariser from uh, Berkeley has a good book out um, about where he calls them filter bubbles, where you have these self-reinforcing thing where the algorithm makes a model of you and then instead of testing whether it's any good, you just become like it. So once again, making yourself stupid to make the algorithm look smart. So what you're doing is you're getting corralled into this little category that can be marketed to. So um, just to explain a bit more of the economics of this, um, and this is present day, not speculative future stuff. Um, let's take a, like a Facebook. Once again, friends of mine, uh, no personal antagonism, but the, the way the business works is there's sort of two versions of you. There's the version that you can manipulate, which is sort of your hagiography, hey, and then there's the other one that they can sell, which you don't get to see. And the other one that they can sell is spontaneously created by algorithms that never quite exist in one place. It's the most tightly held information in the world. It's the stuff, you know, it's the stuff WikiLeaks will never leak and Anonymous will never crack. And it's the stuff that creates your visibility on reality to the degree you care about the internet. And so <laughs> it's, 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 it's and, and the differential between the, the version of you you can see and the version that's operated by the algorithms is the only, that differential is the only value that they can offer to try to have a business feature, right? So those things had better be different or Facebook becomes worth nothing to its investors. And so, um, when you're paying the real customers and you, you're the product, right? And then the real customer is getting access to the version of you that you don't get to see, which you're gradually conforming to, because if you're not conforming it to it, then also the company's worthless. So it becomes this giant behavior modification project. Once again, a giant project of making people stupid to make algorithms look smart. So I could give you many, many other examples. I think that this particular fallacy in which we make ourselves stupid to make machines look smart has transformed our military in a way that is not great. I think it's had a huge effect on the way politics is run that's not great. And it's had a huge effect on finance, education, socializing, <laughs> and on and on and on. And so um, I think it's the fallacy of our age. And that's present day, that's not speculative. That's like right, right now. So um, given that, um, the way we've decided to channel our human stupidity is through the route of pretending that machines are smart. Um, it might not be the particular direction to celebrate 
as a future direction for technical development. So on this sort of pragmatic basis, I object to it because I think right now, in the here and now, it makes us into crappy engineers. And that's the key. And so, you know, when I argue against it, I'm not arguing as some sort of outsider, like, I'm the softy humanist, and I think what you guys are doing is harmful. I'm sort of like, hey, I'm an engineer, and you guys are being crap engineers unless you can understand what you're doing on some sort of a firm basis. Otherwise, you can't even tell if you've done anything good or not. Like with, with the, the outlining triggering being a great example of it. So, because um, as an engineer, you have to have some way of testing whether you've done something or not. Um, it's, it can't be art. Be, and, and the reason it can't be is that it's mandatory. Uh, see, this is, a, this is the interesting thing about art. One of the defining qualities of art is that it might be aggressive. It might sort of, even the most aggressive artist who, I don't know, what a great example would be, but some sort of transgressive public art where you sort of suddenly paint a subway station overnight with stuff and everybody has to see it, it can be painted over. Once you get technology ingrained into the way people live and you start changing them, you, it can't be painted over. So it's like, it's got this, um, just without, um, without wanting to, uh, I want to try to say this gently, I guess, but the difference between technology and art is that technologists have vastly more power in an immediate and sort of objective sense. And, and that's maybe not a nice thing to say in a group of, a room of artists. Artists also have tremendous power of a different kind, but only through persuasion, only by, only by their power can only be consensual. And engineers have the, have an, have the potential for non-consensual power, so it is different. Um, and so, and I, I play both games. Um, I've felt the difference very keenly. Um, the, uh, so, so the thing is that engineers have such vast power in the world today, it's really quite extraordinary that a little, you know, a little gaggle of people in a Palo Alto garage can make something that changes the world a few years later. With, you know, Facebook and Twitter are examples of that. Um, they have a kind of uh, potential power, we have a kind of power, that's really, really wild. And so I feel like this sort of thing isn't so much a game for philosophers or, even, or governments or medical ethics boards or anything like that. It's really about the hearts and minds of young engineers, of the most talented ones. It's really about the quality of nerdiness in our world and what nerdiness is, what, what it means. That, that becomes this huge, huge driver for what the future looks like. Um, so the arguments I find myself making with my fellow nerds over and over again are different than the ones that I would typically talk to an audience of artists about, but I thought I would just try to give you some visibility into it. What I try to go, what I go at them is, how can you measure whether you're making progress in your work that is independent of the philosophy of the person looking at the data of your results? And as soon as you answer that question, you magically turn into a humanist. That's the amazing thing, that that very hard-edged, very res results-driven philosophy um, cuts away all of the stuff that only has meaning if you really believe in hard AI or the or if you believe in the singularity or something. If you if you just tug if you pull away all the ideology, and you want results that you can actually interpret, you force yourself to be a humanist because ultimately humans become the the measure of things. Um, a really interesting story. Um, how many people know who Alan Turing was? How many people know how he died? Okay, so very few artists rose their hands. So let me, let me tell you a story. Um, Alan Turing was uh, one of the two people who principally invented the computer as we know it. Wonderful mathematician. Um, the Nobel Prize of, comp of the computing world is named in his honor. He was a Brit. He, um, during World War II, he worked with uh, very early primitive computers to calculate trajectories of Nazi missiles and to break a Nazi secret code that the Nazis thought was unbreakable. Um, the fact that he broke the code, which was called the Enigma Code, uh, is thought by some to have made a huge difference in the outcome of the war, and in particular to how destroyed Britain was at the end of it. So, um, one of the great heroes of World War II, um, celebrated after the war as one of Britain's great heroes. One problem, he was gay, and at that time being gay was not legal in Britain. So. Um, a strange thing happened. Uh, we have to remember that in this era, in the World War II era, um, the computer had not yet become the metaphor for people. It is now. At that time, the metaphor was uh, steam engines. There were still, you know, um, thermodynamics. That was the metaphor. So 
Um, if you look at, say, Freudian imagery, even Jungian imagery, there's a lot of stuff about pressures building up and basically oppositions of forces and all these things that happen in engines. That was the sort of dominant source of metaphors. So um, the, based on this sort of uh, framework, the idea for what to do with a war hero who was gay was to treat his homosexuality to try to reverse it. And the idea was that somehow there must be some essence or some element that is overdone, has too much force. So somebody had the bright idea of trying to reverse homosexuality by forcibly injecting people with massive doses of female hormones because it would balance out their sexuality and they would no longer be gay. Bizarre. This is, this is historically what happened. Um, Turing developed breasts and other uh, female characteristics after a while, and um, he staged an extraordinary suicide in his lab in which he laced an apple with cyanide like he even killed himself. This was the end of the father of computing. Now, it's a story that a lot of engineers don't know. I think it's quite a poignant one because this happened only weeks after he invented the argument that's become the basis of this whole culture that we just saw the movie about. And this is what's known as the Turing test. So Turing uh, was the first person to really sit down and articulate this idea that a computing machine could become alive, might become conscious or whatever. And uh, the framework in which he puts it is one about rights. And it's a very interesting one because here you have this guy who just opposed this racist uh, regime and then he himself is being destroyed by, for his identity by another regime that he had loved, you know. It's just, it's, so he's, here's a guy who has every right to talk about rights. He's got an incredibly um, uh, justified position from which to moralize, you know. And, and so, he put, so he puts it in these terms. He says, okay, um, let's, we're going to start with what was then a common, uh, commonly known Victorian parlor game where we're going to have a man and a woman each in uh, behind booths or screens or something and they can pass you little notes and that's all. So today we would say they could tweet or something. And um, there's going to be a judge, a man, and the man's job in the Victorian game is to tell who's the man and who's the woman. Now we're going to get rid of the woman, replace her with a computer and we're gonna have a guy judge which is the man and which is the computer. And then Turing asks, if the computer got to the point where the judge could no longer tell, would the computer deserve human rights? Would it deserve empathy, and et cetera? Um, now, <laughs> what's at, th there's a couple of things to say about this. One is if you really read Turing's notes at the time, and they're very few because he did this really just before he died, and so we don't really get to see his full um, elucidation of it, but he was obviously thinking at a greater depth and bringing up all kinds of interesting things that, to my mind, are more sophisticated than most of what one hears from the singularity movement, if I may say so. And um, I'd recommend, the, well, there, uh, there's some good biographies of him, and I try to quote a few of his last papers in my book as well. Um, but I, <laughs> I have to say that this is an argument that's born out of a kind of um, torture. I mean, this is a moment of, this was a horrible, dark moment of loss of faith in humanity. And the whole idea should be understood in that, in that light rather than as a sort of glorious techno future. That's the right way to get the framing of it. And I have to point out that the, the critique I was just giving you before, that you can't tell if the machine's getting stupid, if you're getting stupid to bend over backwards to make the machine look smart, that you can't tell. That critique applies beautifully to the Turing test because, um, of course, uh, the, t the, the computer could uh, be chosen by the judge not only if it somehow ascended, but if the person on the other side became adult, or for that matter, if the judge became adult. And in fact, if you want to be statistical about it, there's three parties, the computer, the competing guy, and the judge. So there's two opportunities for people to become stupid and only one for the computer to become smart. So statistically, you might say whenever the Turing test is passed, it's more likely that it was because of human stupidity than machine intelligence. Uh, <laughs> it's actually never, that's a new line. I just thought of that now. I've never said that before. Um, anyway, um, the, the, um, and of course, you know, if you think about what's going on with Turing, the fact that he replaced the woman and not the man, the whole thing becomes really very poignant that this is really, this whole idea is a very human idea and it's about a failure of 
human nature rather than, and you know, it's a very cynical and dark way of talking about people from a person who is very justified in feeling that way in the moment. Um, and this also gets to this other, this very basic problem, and I'll bring up another name that you should know if you don't. Do you know who Claude Shannon is, was? Okay, I, um, there's a couple, all right. So there's something I have to tell you, and, I'm, and once again, I'm sorry if this is a little harsh. Uh, these ideas are changing our world for the better, for the worse, and it's urgent for people who are intelligent and active to be literate in them. And it, it's sort of not acceptable for somebody to not know certain things. You have to know about Turing, you have to know about Shannon, and a few other things I'll mention. I, I really want you to just go and read a little bit because you need this to know about our world. It's just crucial. Claude Shannon invented the idea of information as it's used in, in um, modern terms in science and engineering. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the whole thing now, but he related it to the fundamental process of, um, of uh, the, how the universe proceeds uh, with what's called thermodynamics. I was just talking before about the metaphors that were applied to Turing of steam engines and so forth. Um, one of the things about that is that there's a kind of a dissipation effect where if there's a hot thing and a cold thing, they'll gradually mix, and this is called entropy. And uh, Shannon defined information as being a sort of a, um, let's say, a hopeless, temporary, but nonetheless real hedge against entropy in the universe as it proceeds. That's one way to put it. That's another thing I've never said before. It's actually pretty good. But anyway, um, the, um, he related it to the fundamental um, processes of how the universe evolves. And this idea of information um, has become the core of the way we think about the internet and computers and all that. But the problem is that we also use the term information to refer to something that people understand. And that's totally different. There's, 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 um, you can, uh, there's a whole lot of information that people don't understand and, and we shouldn't use the same word for two different things. And this becomes a critical source of, of confusion um, so, uh, Shannon, uh, uh, the, you know, actually, this is awful, but I forgot why I was getting into Shannon. Let's see, I was just doing the Turing test. You know what? I had a great place to go with this, and I spaced it out. My apologies to you. Uh, I think I was going to, um, what? Things you should know. Um, give me one second. Huh. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I know I had some really, if I don't remember it, I'll, if I remember it, I'll come back to it, but I can think of another place to go with this, so this is what I'll do. Um, in, the, in the movie we just saw, um, there was um, quite a lot of talk about whether conscious, what consciousness is. And I want to share with you one way of thinking about it that I have found sometimes gets through to engineers. I don't know if it would mean anything to you, but I want to give it a shot. Um, one way to ask what something is in the world is to ask what would be missing if it was removed. So for instance, if there weren't gravity on Earth, we'd all float up or something. Um, and in the same way, let's ask, what would happen if consciousness was removed? And if you look at the range of possible answers, you get a very sort of um, succinct and clear selection of the different philosophical positions. So one position is that if consciousness is removed, absolutely nothing would be different because it was a confusion to begin with. And um, Daniel Dennett might be a good example of somebody who thinks that he's a philosopher, Tuft, um, also a friend. Um, and that, uh, uh, so that's, I've always thought that that couldn't be, I mean, the, my answer to that has always been um, to say consciousness is an illusion gets you nowhere because consciousness is precisely the one thing in, that c wouldn't be reduced if it were an illusion. Everything else would be lessened if it turned out to be an illusion except for consciousness. But anyway, this once again gets into a whole cycle. Then another possible answer is if consciousness were gone, um, things would be similar, but people would be a little bit more um, clumsy or something, or a little bit befuddled, or a little less, a less smart in some way, that it, it sort of fine tunes people or something. And there are people who believe that. And then another answer 
is that if consciousness were missing, the whole universe would suddenly also cease to exist because consciousness has some fundamental role. Um, and that's a little less popular these days. In the 60s, a physicist named uh, Wheeler, John Wheeler, promoted this idea that consciousness has something to do with a quantum, pro quantum reality process that matters, and um, who knows. Um, and, and there are a few other answers, but there's another one I want to sort of suggest to you, which is a little hard to see, but I want you to try to consider it. If consciousness was missing, objectively everything would be the same except there would be no gross objects. Now this is, I want to try to explain what I mean by that. If consciousness were missing, all the particles, the electrons, the photons, the the Higgs boson, if it exists, all these things would continue to move in the same trajectories, they'd continue to interact in the same ways. However, there would be no such thing as an apple, there would be no word of apple, there'd be no idea of apple because there wouldn't be any level of interpretation that's operative in which all of those things can be clumped together to be interpreted that way. And that consciousness is the, if you like, the miraculous existence of a sort of a clumping or higher level overlay on physics that's utterly extraneous to the process of physics. And that's a, that's an interesting one because it really cuts, you know, from a, if you really want to get nerdy about it and talk about physics, you don't need any of these objects. In fact, the more you talk about things like apples or even molecules, the less accurate you get. Um, there is a certain, there, now there, this also can become a sophisticated and difficult argument because there's an idea called coarse graining in physics where there are some levels of coarseness in reality that can function independently of the fine grained stuff underneath them, but that doesn't go far enough to explain this. The truth is that the, the interpretation of a world of objects and ideas is absolutely irrelevant and in fact um, unneeded and absolutely ancillary to any fundamental physical understanding of the world, or engineering for that matter. So where does that stuff come from? The only answer, perhaps, could be consciousness. And the reason I like to present, do you all follow that? It's a bit of a tricky one. Some people have, have trouble with it. The reason I like to present that one is it, be, it gives a sense of just how mysterious and bizarre our situation is here. And it's I think getting that whiff of just how weird it is that we're here, how incredibly bizarre the nature of our being here is, how just perverse and peculiar our situation is at every moment, getting that sensation is um, the thing that transitions an engineer from being the wrong kind of nerd to the right kind of nerd. <laughs> In my experience, like when you feel that, suddenly your work gets better. Now, um, I want to say something else about that, which is um, I'm, um, I occasionally run into a sort of an anti-technology sentiment, especially in the Bay Area. Um, I, I've occasionally been sort of, um, uh, there have been traps sprung on me where a bunch of Rousseauian type people will sort of like descend on me <laughs> and say, we want you to re renounce technology. We should, we have to get back to natural this and natural that. And I'm actually not that, I'm not there. I love technology. I love building things. And in fact, um, I, in my career, I've, I've done a lot of work that people who are into the singularity or into AI or whatever it might be would, would count as their own were it not, that, were it not me who had done it. You know, <laughs> and there's like, I actually love building stuff. I love studying how the brain works. I've had the good fortune to be able to work with various neuroscientists on models of parts of the brain, some of which have turned into working models, uh, particularly one in computer vision and, and another one related to how we interpret smells. And that's incredible work. I love that stuff. I love making algorithms that can do that. And I don't view it as artificial intelligence. To me, it has nothing to do with this whole agenda. It's natural science and it's good engineering. And I've also noticed um, a definite pattern when I work with students or with, with uh, younger engineers in, in a commercial context um, that the more ideology there is about the singularity and stuff, the less work I see coming out of them. And I've really started to feel that it's a sort of a way for people who, and this is gonna be really harsh, but you should see the harshness I have to deal with, so I'm actually being very mild in comparison to the criticism I receive. Um, <laughs> It's really a way for engineers to avoid having to produce something because you can just say, oh, the singularity and AI, and then you talk and talk and like, okay, show me the goods, do something. And um, I really want to see results. And so I, another part of this is actually just trying to 
um, fight against ideology as an alternative to real accomplishment, which I just think is rampant and has gained too much respectability. Um, I'm uh, like, you know, like this, the Singularity Institute is right next to Google and it gets a lot of attention in Silicon Valley. And every moment somebody puts into the ideology is a moment when they're not actually working on their algorithms. And it really can just become this career destroyer and I've just seen it so many times. So if you are a young technical person, for your own sake, for the sake of your future career, drop the ideology for now. It's, it'll always be there waiting for you. It's not going anywhere, believe me. But like get the work done, you know, like, like make, make stuff, make stuff work. Um, that and ultimately, like confronting reality, whether it's engineering and making something that actually functions, um, as opposed to the example I gave in Word and the many other examples, something you can tell really works, um, or if it's just doing something in the world that helps the world, just like being engaged, uh, whether it's in medicine or third world health or whatever your passion is, or just solving a scientific problem, is the way to cut through stupid ideology. So. Um, I, you know, even though I spend a lot of time now because I wrote the book and I'm out talking and stuff, I still spend most of my time on the actual work. And um, actual work beats ideology every time. I ideology can only get you so far. It's it's uh, it's uh, the junk food of the mind. You know, no matter how no matter how well written it is and how how well expressed it is. Um, so uh, that's. That's, I guess, a, a bit of stuff. You want to hear another instrument? Here, you stay there. And this one, um, this one I really like to bring out because um, to me it, it reflects a kind of, there's this sort of, there's this thing you hear all the time that um, now all of us have instant access to all the world's information because we have our little pocket gadget and it connects to Bing or Google and we can look things up. But the truth is, I mean, uh, if you really know about something, you know what a joke that is. Like the actual information about anything in particular, if you really get deep into it, is actually not for real online. Like the online world is still pretty, um, uh, pretty inadequate. And I, I like this because this is an instrument that exceeds the world of information by a huge margin. Um, I found, I bought these off of some Hungarian gypsy hoodlums that, and one of the kids was doing spectacular virtu virtuoso stuff to distract an audience around him as a busker while the other one picked pockets. And um, I, I was impressed with these guys. <laughs> and I, I bought the instrument, didn't share a language, I don't know what they're called. This is undocumented in the ethnomusicology literature. This doesn't exist. You're seeing something that is not documented. It's beyond information. I, I've never seen another one. If you want to look at one at a time, I know some things that are like that, plenty of them, including one in Hungary, but the pair of them together needs to be modified to make the tricks work. And that's, I, this is the only, I mean, I'm the only, I've never seen it, you know? So I can't tell you what it's called, and I can't tell you how old it is. And, I think the world is filled with things like this. And one of the great illusions of the internet is that somehow the, these things disappeared. But here's one, okay? <laughs> anyway, here, I'll, I'll play this thing. It's really cool, it's got, it's, it's very tricky. I call it the walrus sometimes. Let me just. So you definitely want to check your pockets now. 
That's great. Well, well, you know what? I work with Silicon Valley companies. I have a much better scam. <laughs> okay, wow. Um, I hardly know where to begin, uh, but I did want to kind of go back to one thing that you mm -hmm. said to try to see if I could understand it better, which is this, um, this idea the interpretation of the world is extraneous to the actual existence of the object itself. Is that, am I saying that, understanding that correctly? No. Um, <laughs> it's deeper than that. It's that, okay, what is a word? A word might be physically interpreted as a correlation of events in a brain that can be encoded in waves in the air, that can be interpreted by another brain, something like that. So you can think of it as a physical process that we certainly don't physically we don't fully understand now, but <coughs> according to the line of thinking in the film, it should be understandable. And, um, and you know, I can't say I disagree. I, I, I'm very interested in that. Um, but the thing is. If you look at it from a physics point of view, you can explain everything about the molecules in the brain, everything about the molecules in the air, and everything about the molecules in the other brain just using quantum field theory right. or whatever will be better than, than, better than that that has gravity or something. But you can, just, you, can, you can use physics to explain all that stuff without any of those. There's no need for the, con for the word. There's no need for that correlation. It's a little bit like the word, um, the word apple in your brain, I just chose apple because of Turing's story, but the word apple in your brain is kind of like a query within Facebook's database or something like that. Like, it might or might not run, but all the data's still there, it's still churning. Like, you don't, Facebook, <laughs> there, there's an interpretive factor that makes that higher level thing even exist. Right. All right, so, so the thing is that uh, it's not so much that reality exists even without the interpretation, it's that reality is only made of fundamental particles without the interpretation. And that's a, that's a, that's a deeper and stronger claim. Say that again, reality, reality is? is only made of fundamental particles, um, perhaps, uh, what, you know, strings or whatever physics you believe in, right. um, un, without the interpretation. So, why, how, so, how, so the, the interpretation then becomes, why does it happen? Oh, yeah, well, there's that. So, um, I, I mean, I think I, this is where I was getting to sort of the weirdness of, of what's going on here. Right, right. Um, it's funny, I was just listening to um, this, I know this is, this is so tacky and very, but I was listening to a Bob Dylan lyric the other night on a plane, and he has this line, I had this really strange dream that everything is actually as it seems, and I thought that was such a great line, and, and uh, the thing is, um, the, there, is this, uh, there is something really weird going on here. I mean, it is sort of miraculous that we perceive ourselves as having bodies and we perceive words as words instead of just all these particles. Where did it come from? I don't know. I mean, I, like, like I say, like just, just recognizing how incredibly strange our situation is and how mysterious the basic setup here is, is just crucial to being honest, much less being a decent engineer or artist. Certainly, honesty has to precede those things. So talk a little bit more about this idea. I was really intrigued by the metaphor of the steam engine at a, a particular mm. time, and that the current metaphor is the computer. What's the, so what's the implication of that for, for the world that we're currently living in? Well, the thing about the computer is that since we're using the internet to actually be our window to the world and we're letting it change us, the computer is sort of vying to be the last metaphor, if you like. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> the computer is jealous of the future. It wants to, <laughs> it wants it to, wants to understand it. everything. The computer hates things like this. Um, so if you're going to personify it, I'll personify it that way. You know. Um, so, yeah. Um, the um, I'm I'm pretty sure that if we allow ourselves to think clearly and we don't get too dazzled by our own ideal ideologies of the moment will evolve better models of the brain and biology that still won't be perfect, but that's how science proceeds, where you just keep on chugging ahead with things that are measurably better, though you never assume they're perfect. And whenever we get to that point, we'll think back on this era of using computational metaphors for ourselves in the same way that we think about the people who treated Turing as being like, God, what a bunch of crude idiots they were. I'm, I'm sure we'll get there. Um, I mean, I, for one thing, I mean, um, the, the preposterousness with which we overestimate the performance of our present-day software just amazes me. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, uh, like, you know, I mean, the thing is that in order to... I loved to your outline analogy, by the way. I hate that thing. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, the guy who came up with that is very nice, you know. Yeah. But the the um, the thing is the um, the thing is that the um, we in order to tell if you've achieved something as an engineer, you have to have a test, and you can only have a test against a contrast. Right. So in other words, you need to you need to say. Um, I'll test a patient taking the drug against a patient not taking the drug, and I'll do a bunch of those, and then I can do a study, and I can tell if the drug is doing anything. And if you, if you can't do that, you, you don't know. And so we don't do that with software anymore. We just sort of say, hey, look at all this great stuff. And you say, oh, wow, Netflix really knows what I like in movies. And of course, you're not really, you, don't, you never have the honest test. So, so it, it's meaningless. And, and, and we, have, we create this fantasy world of functionality in software on a constant basis, particularly um, in social software, and um, well, once again, we make we, we're vulnerable to making ourselves uh, stupid to make it seem. Yeah, smart. exactly. I mean, yeah. isn't it also the thing? That, this is what always annoys me about the sort of Amazon thing mm -hmm. too. Is right, you're just narrowing and narrowing and narrowing my choices and not allowing me the opportunity to to discover something that is outside of my previous history of things I've been thinking about or working on or talking about and because I like saw the cover and it looked cool and it has nothing to do with anything that I've ever been and interested then, in. Yeah, and so like your that. choice space gets reduced in your right. head. But see, Amazon is um, polite and tells you about right, it, right. which is um, Facebook does not and Google does not. And, and Bing, I think, will start to, but it, it does not presently. And um, and this is a real this is a real issue. So you don't, you know, if you're if you're in on the game, that's one thing. But right. if you're not, then then you really are in a subservient position, and that's that's not fair to people. And especially non-technical people might not get that. They might not understand what they're not seeing. And the absurdity of it is just like, let me put it this way. Let's look at Netflix for a second. We have some tens of thousands of titles on it. I'm not sure what the count is now, but it's under 100,000, I think. And so that might sound like a big number, but you know, a typical personal computer these days might have hundreds of thousands of files, and most of them maybe you don't care about. But, but um, if you want to, you know how to search those. You know how to find your way around it. It's not perfect, but the point is the, 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 the process of giving you the tools that you can understand to get around in a computer is the job of whoever writes the operating system. And, um, by having this recommendation engine, you save yourself the hard work of really putting people in control of finding the thing. So once again, you make this, the software look smart by, in this case, allowing both the users to bend over backwards and be stupid by accepting recommendations without knowing why they're there, but also the engineers at Netflix, who I'm sure are great people, but, but the thing is, it's a much, much lazier, easier, sort of poor job of engineering to make a recommendation engine than a really good browser, which requires real work and a lot of empirical study. I mean, there's no comparison. AI is the cheapest trick in the book.